pieces well, of shit or whatever. I mean, I think every podcast becomes an institution, right? I mean, I, I think as we set out in the beginning, now 15 episodes ago, it finds its form as it invents itself. It's very much like a bacteria that just like, that kind of like, you know, gels out over, over a surface. Yes, that's true. I think that that's one thing that podcasters before they become podcasters don't realize they think that they are they think that they are starting a podcast about something and they're mm-hmm. that's that's not what it is yet you don't know what it's about at first well yeah there's a good there was an article maybe a year or two ago where where the author suggested that podcasts are identity workplaces where essentially you come, it's like a studio, it's like a forge where you come and you actually work out what it is, who you are and what you do and what you have to say. And it's like, you only do it. You only find that out in the doing of it. The best, I think a lot of the best podcasts are like that. Now that I'm thinking about it, there are, there are audio programs that are designed to deliver you specific information that are read off a script. And like, yeah, okay, I guess that's mm-hmm. a podcast. But we're talking about these recorded conversations where, you know, people just go. Yeah. And, well, and I mean, I feel like a Joe Rogan kind of like excels at this, uh, but it's a way different style than uh, Brene Brown, who I really, really like. You know, it's like you and I don't really like do research for the episode. We don't really have an overarching <laughs> idea. I mean... It always comes back to our same subjects. Um, But like you were just saying, you know, thinking about, well, are people going to want to hear this? Um, Maybe, eventually. Yeah, it's like, how how useful is it? You know, what's the utility of it? Well, we've been doing this for how long now? How long, like, has it been eight months, seven months? Even longer? Mm. Something like that? Let's see. I mean... We definitely, it was definitely last year. Um, yeah, where, how far along in the pandemic was it at the beginning? Was it in, what, was it a couple months in? I think it was the summer, may, maybe, or something yeah. like that. Anyway, so, yeah, so coming up he, on nine months, probably. Here's, um, yeah, how many, our baby. Nine, nine months. We said we'll we make a left? baby, and we, <laughs> and we, we have a, right. a 16 horned baby now. <laughs> um, so I have started three podcasts and i'll tell you how mm-hmm. they worked out so the first one and I, tell tell us about your podcast yeah 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 um so i have three podcasts the first one was about composing music and i oh. got because i had all these friends that were successful music composers and i wanted to go and talk to all of them and then i decided that i wanted to talk about creativity in general and oh. so i i planned these out and i decided i'm gonna record three episodes and have three episodes loaded and ready to publish before i publish the next one so i you know Mm -hmm. if i get backed up i can do this and so i recorded and recorded and i recorded i edited 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 add music i edited i added music i drove all over the place because this was in 2016 or 17 Mm -hmm. and uh people wanted to do things in person then and i released one episode and i never released another one and the whole thing fell apart because i ended up moving and for Many reasons it wasn't as perfect as I wanted it to be. And so therefore I said, it just can't happen. (laughs) The second podcast I started and we recorded, we we went for about two and a half, three years. What was this one about? This one was about crypto. This is is the one that I was still doing up until until December. But this one... Until December, okay. Well, here's the thing. What is it about? Yeah, I guess it was about crypto because the the co-host and I, we we both knew each other from that world. So that's what it was about. This is mainly what we were talking about, but we had no idea what the show was actually about. And mm-hmm. we would meet up every week, you know, remotely and record and just talk about whatever we, we th- were thinking and feeling about, I don't know how it related to that subject. And months went by half a year went by six months went by and people were not listening we got very few listeners Mm -hmm. um we were doing very little promotion we were doing very little to to um to do to add anything to what we were doing we were we 
we were kind of stagnating. I, I, as, as an artist, I felt like this, I felt like it wasn't mm-hmm. a good thing to do. I wanted to be pushing forward constantly. And my co host said, Nope, Nope. We're just going to record our voices every week and we're going to publish them. And in a way he was very right to do that because if I had my way, I would have burnt out and stopped probably doing them because they wouldn't have been good enough or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, like the first podcast I, I tried. But we kept on doing them. It took maybe about a year and a half before we started to get listeners and we started to get attention. And then we got this critical mass of listeners that... How many is that, lo- by the way? I'm just curious. Uh, I don't... I mean, not not very many. Uh, between hundreds and thousands, but not, not wow. hundreds of thousands. Um, and it was like... Um, it was... Uh, it was... It was... Uh, it turned out that we had a particular um, perspective on that crypto industry that did not exist anywhere hmm. else. And we were both mm. we were both just ignorant enough and just knowledgeable enough to talk about it in a way that interested people. You know, it wasn't like we were brand new and it wasn't like we were experts and we definitely were not providing any nuggets of wisdom or whatever you want to call it. Hmm. We were just kind of talking about our emotions and stuff uh and 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 I think people liked that genuine this so the third podcast i started was this one and well you forgot the one you do with noah so you have four that's true uh, there are four um so the third podcast was was this one and i feel like um in a way there were times when i thought like why are we doing this i don't know how many listeners we've had m- maybe one maybe two <laughs> and and then I've thought, you know, well, that doesn't really matter. That's not why I'm doing this. I'm not doing this to get listeners. I'm doing, I have my own therapeutic reasons for doing this. I have my own just in, I, in the enjoyment I get out of talking with you or whatever. Or how I, the experiment of listening to what we recorded a week later and going, wow, I said mm-hmm. that. Wow, you said mm-hmm. that. That's pretty cool. Let me put that into my book. Mm-hmm. Um and uh and that's a different experience and i feel like nine months in we really don't know what this is about yet and we don't know who's going to be listening Mm. to this a year from now and who it's going to be reaching and who is going to care and who's going to love it as much as we love it now and that's just as good of a reason to keep doing it as long as we like it yeah um yes and then and then the 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 podcast with noah was similar in that we were just going to chat and it was not going to be about anything very relevant um it was going to be about whatever was relevant to us in that moment and i think that that hard but we haven't done as many recordings of that because it didn't it wasn't serving a purpose in in our lives in the right way it, uh, well i mean it wasn't there was nobody cracking the whip to say hey let's do this like you and i meet up at least once every what this it's probably been three or four weeks since we recorded the yeah. last one but it's still pretty regular yeah. I mean, it's like not not a week or two goes by where we mention, hey, we should record, I miss it, or something, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And so we're obviously getting something out of it. But the thing that I'm doing with Noah, Noah is kind of already on. He's got a new podcast now with, with Robert DeLong, another economist. So he's kind of into oh, that cool. thing now. So um, uh, we're, you know, we're, we're going to interview Vitalik on Thursday. So that'll be kind of fun. Um, so we'll probably do episodes every once in a while, but it's not going to be something that we it's not going to be an it's not going to be an enterprise well i so. want I, this almost begs a question of uh podcasting and podcasters of when when two people find some chemistry right like you and i have like established some common ground we can play well together like how does it go from this kind of we're just going to record our voices and see what happens to then starting to to have guests and, and how do you go from you and me being the only people in the room to all of a sudden we have another guest who may not know us that well um, mm-hmm. and the, we should let them be the kind of like the focus of the show. We've played around with this on Clubhouse, I think. Uh, well, I mean, I also was a guest on yours and Noah's podcast, which was true. a total delight. And I actually <laughs> reread the episode description. I think it was yesterday and just the thing like, yeah, that was so much fun. <laughs> and it was an honor and privilege. And it's like still one of like the things I, I think to point people to when I realize my writings are inscrutable quite often. Um, 
I think I get myself over better in, in voice and writing is just like practice for the human voice. Yeah. No, you're, 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 you're a great host. Uh, how we, how we, um, yeah, I mean, we've experimented, we've been on clubhouse before in empty rooms that people would walk into and they didn't know it yet, but they were the guests. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's true. Now, if we can crack the code on how to, how to record that, that makes it cool, but that's probably against the clubhouse clubhouse ethos, which I think is fun. Well, I think that I, I think it would actually be pretty, we would, we would be pretty good at having, um, a guest, I think, I mean, we should, we should think about doing that Yeah. on, on this. It's a, it's one of those things where it's like, uh, yeah, I, I haven't really thought about it much and I don't, I don't even, I ha- yeah, I guess I just haven't thought about well, it. Well, I mean, having some, some female energy, I think yeah. would be, would be good. Uh, cause if it's just like you and me, it's, I don't know, we can sometimes get into that left brain competition, rah, rah, rah mode, but, um, yeah, the the uh, the testosterone of, of being a male artist. <laughs> yeah, and it's like no that no one needs at all. <laughs> that we can have a we can have a funeral for the for the privileged white male creative right yeah. here and now. We can declare it dead yes. once and for all. We can okay. kill it. Connor Overs, just leave. <laughs> <Connor Oberst>. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but not yeah. Andrew Bird. You can't take Andrew Bird. He's too talented of a musician. Well, what, what's funny when I think about having a guest on this uh, on on this podcast is that like we both have our therapy our reasons. We this is both therapy for for us. So bringing a guest on is like almost unfair to that guest. Do they even know that we're like totally well? Yeah, we're totally self absorbed on this show. Well, that's <laughs> why you know that's why you like it's it's a different game when there's a third player. Um, we have to become more facilitators and like conducting the energy that's true between all of us, right? All of a sudden we have a lot more, um, chemistry to work with, right? With you, it's with, it was just you and me, our two presences are the only things in the room. But when we have three presences and each presence has its own memory, its own imagination, its own internal monologue there's so much more to unlock. There's so much more to play with. Um, it yeah. almost, becomes, I mean, I am I, like, I'm, I'm thinking about it in terms of like a basketball metaphor of like how to like move the ball around, how to involve the other players, how to move up and down the court as a team. Um, you know, and it enables you or me to be more strategic, right. Rather than just, you know, record, we let the river rush where it rushes and all of a sudden an hour has passed and we've maybe made four or five good points. Um, you know, other podcasts, of course, are more strategic, more here's what it's about. You know, again, research, you know, a, you know, questions listed out that we can kind of like go to, to kind of keep the conversation on the rails rather than it's a great big whirlpool of salt water spinning around a nexus and we don't know where it's going next or why we're listening. Yeah. Well, I, I, I like it for that reason though. Mm-hmm. But, well, if you're listening and you would like to be a guest on <laughs> <laughs> in the, these recordings, then yeah. Contact us. Yeah. Comment below <laughs> or, or send us direct messages on any of the social media platforms. We, are on and can't stop clicking on. Hmm. Um, well, one one subject I think I think you and I could maybe arrive at is uh, creator economy criticism. I feel like <laughs> I'm always just seething with skepticism of. The notion of fans, the notion of audience, um, and and how really I, I think a a component of creativity is being alone and never really reaching the other side in the present moment. It only happens in retrospect that you've made something that then someone vibe like like yeah. vibes with. 
Well, let's let's define what the cre- what creator economy means. Oh God, uh, you do that. Well, I don't really know. I mean, <laughs> let's, let's talk about it because. So I saw Naval post posted today. He said, um, "In the future, everyone will be part of the creator economy." Is what he posted on Twitter. Right. And uh, and I, I I don't know why, but I, when I read Naval post, I stop and think. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and then you know when we have someone like fucking Elon Musk um, spending all his time on Twitter now and um, and on Saturday Night Live or whatever the hell. Mm-hmm. Um, like now, now, uh, or, or the president of the United States communicating with people through social media and looking for an audience, like I'm talking about the previous president, um, like that's, that's the, the economy is how is, is it's, it's not a creator economy. It's the attention economy, right? It's how much att- personal attention you mm. can get. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Like what is, well, like, what, <laughs> Yeah, a, a, what is a, a creator? Well, I'll be part of the creator economy. I mean, I think that just means that people are expressing themselves in, I don't know if it's as much in public as it is in the form of a file. Uh, a file stays the same. Now we can talk about, you know, JPEG file, like, uh, decay, but really it's a it's a society mediated by images and facts rather than live expression and human beings are always changing um i mean it's almost like we live in a society that has more faith in data and in an image a piece of media a a still image than in a human being, which is a pro a human being is a process, um, a chemical process. And it's, it's not exactly like a, like a photograph or a transcript. It, it's a movement. It's, I mean, it's almost like, you know, there's another podcast I, I heard, I think it was Brene Brown. It's like, she was in bringing someone who was saying, you know, like, like death is happening all the time. It's like, that's what life is. You know, it's like sort of mm-hmm. the same metaphor of like, that everything's on fire. It's because, because, because all that on fire means is reacting with oxygen. So even if uh-huh. a piece of paper is, is not like literally in flames, it's still technically right. burning. It's oxidizing. Yeah. It's rusting. It's Rust, uh, right. It's rusting. Yeah. It's like all those things are, are processes. Um, hmm. So yeah, I mean, I mean the creator economy, I, I mean, it's, it's very natural to tweet. It's certainly very natural to record audio. Um, I don't know. It's like, like one, one kind of uh, cynical line I kind of keep coming back to saying is, you know, that babies were the original audio creators. Because they're going, <laughs> and it's like, that's what everyone who's a creator does. It's you wake up and you get back to your computer and you're like, how am I alone? How is it still capitalism? Why am I still anxious? Why does nothing I did yesterday and before matter? Why am is I it, so screwed? Why do I have so much email? Why is my life so so complicated? Why do I have so much dread? It's dread. So we create to get out of dread, and the dread never stops being there. And so, but some people are creating, and they they don't seem like their lives are dreadful. I'm, I have not yet. I have Twitter open in front of me right now, and I see that uh, Paul McCartney has a new eye yoga video for us all. So, I yoga E Y E E Y E I yoga can really help anti age your vision. Like this, he doesn't have a dreadful life that that's he's awesome. like <laughs> that he is. Um, he, yeah, I mean, is he alone? So good. Is he alone right now? Paul is McCartney he... is so good. <laughs> God damn, he's in his nineties and he's putting I. God, it's so good. <laughs> he's we, he's making content. 
Wow. He's a creator. <laughs> well, he's a, he's a creator. I mean, he, and it's like, he King clearly, of creators, clearly he is. He clearly mm-hmm. doesn't need the money. Um, mm-hmm. But he just keeps making music because the gift is there. You know, all, you know, it's like Miles Davis, like, says the same stuff in interviews. It's like, the music is there all the time. <laughs> it's there right now. It's here right now. I, it's always there. And it's like, yeah. you, you, ha- you have to keep doing it. Um, we got to learn how to do some eye that's, yoga. <laughs> and that's a beautiful place to get um, where, yeah. where you, you've just pledged allegiance to it. And you've accepted your fate. And it's like, well, I'm going to do this as long as I live. And it's a great, I mean, in a sense, it's a, it's a great liberation mm-hmm. because you, you can abandon all other plan B's and it doesn't matter if you succeed because really survival is success. If you're listening, congratulations, you're a success. You made it. Yeah. Um, because yeah, I mean, all the other conventional success metrics like, like, don't help you. Um, now maybe Paul was never anxious. Maybe he's the same today. At wait, he's not really ninety something, is it? That he can't he can't be that old. No, he's got he's got to no. be in his eighties at most. So yeah, but. I mean yeah, I mean let's say he's in his seventies. Like, is he really much different in spirit now than he was in his twenties? I, I would say maybe not. I don't know. As I get older, I realize that people don't change that much. So probably not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, unfortunately people you don't think change. you, yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's so funny to like, think back even to like five years ago with how much you think you'll change. It's like, Oh, every other five years from here, is going to be just as much change as the last five. Yeah. And then I think you start plateauing. And you're like, oh, fuck. There's actually just a very, very long middle if you can survive it. Yeah. And it's like, geez, like we really have another 40 years of good old 15 hour days of, you know, I mean, either dread or wonder or just mere awareness and opportunity of, um, reading, listening, sending, connecting, scheduling, you know, doing all of, all the things, um, which is not bad. I mean, like we've got to the point now where it's like, you know, this is what, well, like, this is water, you know, whether it's a meeting, whether it's a this or a that or a that, it's like, you've like been through enough and you've heard enough and read enough where you can kind of imagine what it'll be like when you get there to mm-hmm. even like, you know, go through a divorce and then have to go from that Zoom call to then, like, the most boring policy discussion at your workplace. It's like, you just work through it and get through it. And you can tell your friends later or not, because everyone's got their own dramas that hurt. And everyone and everyone's hurt. And everyone's kind of, like, lugging around their heart. And everyone's trying to learn how to not carry their heavy heart alone. And that's a lifelong apprenticeship. And I think we, we create content because we haven't unburdened ourselves yet. And we, we write because that's the, that's the, that's the unburdening. Do you, have you always have you always felt that? Or have, do you feel that's always been true? Like, when did you, when did you really start... When did you start creating? <laughs> well, no, I, I, yes, you started creating as a baby when you started making audio. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, like, were you when you were, were you, when you were a teenager? Were you writing? Were you publishing? And were you? I was not writing and publishing. I mean, I, I was, I was playing music, but I, I didn't see it as art at all, at all. Mm-hmm. I, w- I was very left brain about. I was, I, I was a, mm-hmm. I was a fairly accomplished alto saxophone player. And I, uh-huh. I, I, I won the awards in it middle school so yeah. and high school. And I, I was part of, I, I, I was part of like one or two, like traveling bands. Um, yeah. Like I won a lot of awards for music. It's um, so crazy that like they, that, that is how we teach music to people as a skill and a 
as a thing to be done. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I think I liked the comfort of it, of like, there's a, I mean, it's like a math proof. It's like, yeah. you either played it right or you didn't. Yeah. You but feel good. I'm good ne- at this. Like, yeah. like, like never was it really, a, I mean, I don't know if I knew how to talk about it, but I didn't know how to talk about emotions uh-huh. at, at all. I mean, that, I mean, you know, school is not made for that. Um, now <laughs> no. that's a, that's another conversation, yeah. that, you know, you know, many 30 and 40 somethings are up on a Sunday night, you know, thinking about how to make education better. You know, that's the, one of the popular topics for the, the overeducated and understimulated, uh, very serious adults on, on So Twitter. how is your emotion coming out as a teenager? Cause I, I was mm. definitely, I mean, I was. I, I was never very good at, at making music in the, in the, uh, whatever you that structured way that you were good at. Like mm. I tried, I tried it, but for me it was too emotional really. And all I could do is strum my guitar and write songs. And Maybe, that, that, I mean, you were too emotional. I was too emotional. Like, I, yeah. yeah, it was that I was too emotional. And the, the thing is, is that I thought that I didn't understand music because I didn't, because I didn't, I wasn't as good at sight reading, and I wasn't as good mm. at technically playing an instrument that could be a band or orchestra instrument or whatever. So I always thought that I wasn't good enough. And w- what a what a painful realization when I got older and realized, oh, it's my ear is good, and that's all I need. And like, mm. <laughs> and like, shit, I wasted all that time thinking that I sucked at music because because uh, mm. I couldn't do what other people did. But deep down, there they don't they. They wish they could do what I could do. They exactly. wish they could. They wish they right. could hear the emotion in music. And and now, as a music professor, that's kind of what I do. Oftentimes, I'm teaching film nice. scoring. Uh, film scoring. It's like, what do you think your job is to when you're a film film composer? What What do you think your job is? Hmm. Your job is to read the emotion and convey it. That's all. That's all it really is. I mean, hmm. sure, yeah. Sometimes it's passage of time or setting or or world building, but most of the time, all you're doing is conveying emotion. And, uh, and mm. that's something that, that they don't teach when you're younger. But anyway, my question was still like, how did your emotion come out as, as a teenager, if not through art, as through not through creating? Yeah. Well, I, I was very cerebral. I think, um, I, I, I was a maniacal, uh, music downloader and, you know, less, maybe less of an audio file in, in terms of like the, the content of the music per se, but more about keeping my library organized and meticulous, getting mm-hmm. the, you know, the artist and album and song title, right with the right capitalization and, wow. uh, having good album art and like really like keeping it orderly. Um, I also played a lot of, uh, an online, um, multiplayer game called Diablo two. Lord of Destruction. Some people might know it. Um, I was playing. I mean, there were some days where I would like do that for like twelve plus hours a day, um, wow. and like I was like very knowledgeable about how to build characters. You know the the competitive landscape out there, the kinds of characters you can build. Um, so you had a drive there. I had a drive there for sure. There was a very complicated economy. Um, there were forums, you, you know, you could build a reputation if you were like a big player. And I was, you know, not, I mean, I was probably like a third tier kind of player, but I mean, you know, I mean, I think anyone putting 12 plus (laughs) hours a day into, into something is, uh, you know, takes it personally. Um, I was an athlete, um, but it, it, it was never really about emotion. It was always about getting it right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I only. Yeah, God, I I must have just kept my emotions bottled up. Um, I never. Yeah, it's like, do I even remember rage? No, I mean, you know, I mean, like being an only child. I mean, a lot of times, like rollerblading uh, around. You know, I I got into hockey randomly, and I like built a net and. I got into would, hockey like, too. Yeah. Sh- shoot it. Well, I saw your post about, about rollerblading. I've been thinking. <laughs> I've been really thinking about getting rollerblades. I wish I. <laughs> me too. I wish I. I bought them. My friend gave me a really good website with, with like some really intense like ch- choices to make. You know, I, I mean, so I, I can send you that, and maybe we can do it. 
I was in um, rollerblading when I was 13 because I, no, when I was 12, I was 12, but that's because a lot of my friends were into skateboarding and I was too, mm-hmm. I was too anti-popularity to do that. So I was like, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to ride fucking rollerblades. Anti-popularity. And they were like, you nerd. <laughs> I was that's like, yeah, just watch me. I'm going to be the one guy on rollerblades. <laughs> but, um, um, but yeah, that's interesting. You know, my parents were both artists. I'm, like my Mm, my yeah. uh my mom was a, a painter and she did airbrush stuff and uh and my my father was kind of a my father was a was a was a writer who loved writing but always struggled to, he was always looking for for to get published you know back in the 90s like there was no right. internet so you couldn't just publish your own stuff you couldn't be yeah. your own publisher and so for him, it was always yeah. like he was an unpublished writer who loved doing it. But, um, but, but so, so yeah. I, every time I did something that was creative, I was re- rewarded with, uh, with praise, whether, whether it was good or bad or whatever, when I was a kid. I had a really weird family though. My parents were not together, um, but they were still kind of hippie artists or whatever. Um, mm. So I was, uh, yeah. So when I was a teenager, I definitely thought of myself as an artist or not an artist, not an artist in the way that you would think of it. Like not so much an artist, more like somebody who had a mission to make music, I think. Mm. And, and a mission to make music that I thought nobody else would ever understand. Kind of the bedroom, bedroom ambition. Um, Do you like the word calling? A calling to make was, music? It was definitely a calling. Um, well, it was one of those things like when I was in high school, I I kind of always thought that music was not something that was going to be, I was never going to be able to make a living making music. I didn't think that was possible. So I, I was going to go to, I went to school and I was going to, you know, study engineering. And then the calling was so strong that I ended up doing music instead. Right. Mm-hmm. That was like, oh, obviously I'm supposed to do music and I can do that here. Uh, so that's what I'll, what I'll do. Um, but I, it was one of those things where I never thought that it was a legitimate thing to spend your life doing. And, uh, and that was another being a product of them, the meritocracy well, I, that our, that our boomer parents raised us in. Well, that's like, weird. I, I mean, I mean, you see a Paul McCartney, and it's like, well, you know, and I mean, there's some, I mean, there's a hundred names we can mention of people who clearly have made music their life and it is their life. Oh, there's so many, so many, so many, yeah. so many, so many, but, but that wasn't the, that wasn't very clear when I was a kid, mm-hmm. the, the information wasn't there, you know? And well, it, I, I kind of, I, it's both one of the things I'm most grateful for and things that I'm most resentful for is the fact that the first half of my life did not have the internet in it. Um, huh. You know, up until I was about, I mean, I, it, I'm 40 years old. So yeah, so you've I got, did, okay, you've got six years on me. I, I did not have internet in my house that wasn't, I never had internet in my house growing up that wasn't dial-up. And I had dial-up when I was maybe uh, 16 or 17, maybe 17 and wow. I was lucky I had it because my dad was kind of into that stuff. He was kind of a nerd who built his own PCs and stuff. So we oh, had nice. the internet. Yeah. And I had a couple of other friends that got into like hanging out in chat rooms and stuff like that. Um, but uh, but like because of that, it was a it was a very um, sure you can put anything you can do anything if you put your mind to it. Like there was that attitude, but it was never a you can do anything if you put your mind to it. And, and figure out how to do it. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it was kind of like, oh, if you want to be a musician for the rest of your life, then all you got to do is make a bunch of music and the rest will figure itself out. Well, no, that's not how it works. Like you actually have to figure out how you're going to get people to listen to your music and how you're going to create it and how you're going to get it out to people and how you're going to brand yourself or whatever. Like there's all that p- part of it. And I think that now is more clear because the the internet exists and there's information flying everywhere. And if you Google how to become a musician, there's a hundred websites that will pop up and a bunch of blog posts and things like that, that will give you some idea of how you could actually become a musician for a living or follow when you follow your favorite artist or whatever on Instagram and you see what they do. It's like not too hard to do the same things. 
but um, well, yeah. I mean, I think it's as simple as you have to probably put five hours a day into your craft and making your content, making the thing, and then probably five hours into understanding how it fits into the ecosystem and sort of where your skills are right now compared to maybe just like compared the market. to like the market is yeah good. the market yeah. but also like you know where you could be in a week month year decade yeah i consider and, it the market but not not necessarily the market for money the market for something like how is how is whatever you're doing going to exist in the world yeah and when i was 15 i was i was making i was I put out my first cassette when I was 16 years old, but I didn't really have a plan for that because I didn't know who that cassette was for or who was going to listen to it. But, uh, oh, yeah. I mean, and it's too bad. I mean, now you and I, I can you can tell from the way that we talk, it's like we already see things in terms of comparison. Whereas a 16-year-old, I mean, I had no, I had no, ab- absolutely no, none of this vocabulary of the market or a personal oh brand my God. but Ugh. now and, and you know now we've got kids where they're that's the you know when i use the term died in the wool they are yeah and yep. it's like god like why why rush to being an old bitter person and you're like 12 and you think <laughs> that you're, you're done i wonder if there'll be a back black backlash against that eventually i wonder if like there's going to be a you know, there's like, what's that school that that raises kids and and doesn't allow them any technology, no no uh, no internet. It sort of reminds me of like a Montessori school, but I don't think that's what you're talking no, about. No, it's um, called um, it's called the I forget what it's called, but there's like it's something that very like, um, very very well to do, uh, like uh, upper class or upper middle class uh, parents will send their kids to these schools where they have no no internet until they're like 13 years old or 14 years old. Yeah, that that sounds pretty healthy, right? I, I mean... It's either healthy or it's cruel. I can't tell. It's one of those. You like, know, there's really enough... There's enough in your immediate environment. Because all the internet does is it, it gives you a digital version of, of some reality somewhere else. But I think that only works. You only can make meaning of the digital if it can map back to an in-person experience you had, right? I think you might be right about that. I, I mean, I, I think what the reason that to me it can seem inhumane to deny somebody technology like that is it's basically like you could, to me, it's like kind of hamstringing somebody into the world of the future. Uh, mm. except, except that, except that those people, kids that are growing up being raised by social media are missing a fundamental i mean they're like hamstrung from the beginning you know yeah i mean because (laughs) what what's ultimately going to be missing from the future is the ability to not use the internet and that's and and to sit with human beings and just be right and again do all do all that stuff singing dancing moving the body cooking, laughing, talking, singing, things that have nothing to do with analytics, have nothing to do with with digital media, except maybe how we've learned how to do the thing, right? Now it's cool, you know, you're not just limited to your own tribes, dances, and songs, which is pretty cool. You can become mm-hmm. kind of multicultural, um, though I think it is important to go visit the place um, and kind of be there and, and understand where that culture comes from. Right? Why? Yeah. Why Spanish food is the way it is, or Mexican food is the way it is. You go to the land and you you see why. I I wish I could say more. Um, well, we we used to use the internet to escape reality. Um, now it is now reality. We use re- now we now we reuse reality to escape the internet. I think. Well, yeah. And, I mean, because it used to be that the real world was the one outside your door i mean the fact that people take breaks people we have to take breaks from 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 social media you have to take breaks from the internet like you're right i i I never really thought of it about it like that but the ability to the ability to not use 
the internet or technology in the future will be the real skill. The ability to hang out with your family and not have a phone in yeah. front of you. Well, and I mean, the skill is, is, is to not want to escape. Not wanting you to know, escape and not feel the, phone. Now, what the phone did and the internet yeah. does is it showed you how empty those things were, right? Mm-hmm. Like, why would we want to bring work emails home? How, how could it be possible that what was happening at home was so boring that we would choose to essentially go back to the office while we were at home. But apparently it's yeah. like, oh, wow, like people are on work email after five o'clock, after yeah. nine o'clock, and they're, on, they're emailing at one, two a.m. when they don't really, they don't really have to. You could leave work at work. It's like, well, what does that say about home? And it's like, oh, like we haven't really talked about how we want to be at home and what that is. Right. And I think really, really, I mean, it's up for a renegotiation, right? If, I mean, and here's where to be an artist, to be a, or I mean, even a designer is like, you know, let's be a lifestyle designer. You know, now that we're online, you know, either on the screen or thinking about what's on screen all day, it's like, well, what, what should home, what does home and relaxation and unplugging look like? I would have, I mean, what is unplugging? Unplug. I wonder what that, what that means. Cause I can't stop thinking about things in terms of, I guess, connected thought and the fact that I'm always thinking. And so are the other people who I follow that I message with all the time. It's like, I don't want to forget them or unplug from them. Yeah. It's complicated. It's complicated. I mean, it, well, have you ever had the situation where there's been some sort of um, some sort of crisis, and your first reaction is to go to your phone or your computer? Like that's your first reaction. Well, depends what 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 kind of crisis, right? Um, what if it's like a national crisis? <laughs> then yeah, it's like I gotta be. I gotta, what if, what if it's something that's I'd... not personal, but it's something you know big? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, essentially like what going on Twitter is for me now is like walking out of my tent mm-hmm. would have been for someone thousands of years ago. So I go, I want to get back to the main. Yeah. I want go <laughs> to go to, 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 to the place where others are. Yeah. Where are the, where, where are the others? Right? I mean, I, I very much care, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like, well, well I want to see if the people I care about are talking about this thing that I heard or sense is a crisis. And we've kind of looked, we look to others for confirmation of whether our inner feeling is correct and valid or whether it's a phantom or an illusion or a, some kind of a blip. Well, the last year has not been the best for, I mean, we, that's the only way to get out of your tent would be to go on something like Twitter because we can't, couldn't meet in real life, right? We couldn't actually, I mean, like go to where the people are, go to where the others are. I mean, we weren't, we haven't yeah. been able to do that very, very well. Yeah. And I, and I hope that we can, I, I don't know what it's going to be like in the future when we, I don't know. I don't well, know. you know, I, I've now built my, my notion of, um, the people who are my people, um, using Twitter and I've said the internet in general, such that it would be hard to like feel really at home in a city. Now stay with me here. Like (laughs) cities and I think families and schools, um, and companies used to give you a social network. It's, it's saying, here are the 157 people who are going to make up your mental model of the others. Now, we get to handpick them, right? People never had control over who the others in their life were. They were just there. You're born into a family. You go to school. You go to church. There are your others. You don't tune in. You don't, you know reread your list of people and say, Hmm, I'm kind of bored of them. I'm going to unfollow them. 
and I'm going to, oh, here's this other person who lives thousands of miles away. Oh, let me tune into the things that they type on their thumbs onto their LCD screen on their iPhone and hit tweet. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, the future of cities is is interesting. Now, now that we've decided who we like, you know, I mean, I, I've... I've decided who I who I like and who I want to like be on the same team with for the rest of my of my days. Um, hmm. You know, those are the people I want to I want to share space with. Um, now, is it that we all congregate in in a few limited number of cities? Right. I mean, hmm. the whole discourse about. Miami and Austin has been interesting of like, you know, let's, let's all get together with our Twitter friends and, and go, you know, take over a city. It's like, well, how many people do you need? 20, <laughs> 10? It's like, how, how much is enough? Whereas when, you know, if you're older, you get more established, you get married, you, you have a house. It's like, you're okay with having your digital network be more virtual. And, you know, I mean, I feel this in the Bay Area, I bet you do too, that the physical surroundings um, of it, right? Even though, you know, the Bay Area gets can, can get a very bad rap online, um, I have a sense of where you live and it's really beautiful and strange, wondrous country of blue skies and rolling hills. <laughs> it's true, it's it is. It's very weird. It's like, it's like a relief to be able to like walk around that. And it's like, ah this is life and I'm real and the digital is real too. And those people are out there and I care about them and we all live somewhere, but I'm, I'm happy with almost like the spaciousness between your day to day life as a human being on the earth day to day, season to season while others are living their own way, wherever they are like, you don't have an urge to like go close that gap and go move with your wife to where your friends are. It's like, you're happy with what you've got. Kind of. I don't know. Like I, what I, so I, I only moved to the Bay area, you know, a year. Well, it's now it's been a year and a half, but I did not want to leave LA cause that's where all my friends were. And I spent a lot of time with friends. I'm a musician. So I, I, we got together in the same place and made music all the time. And, um, and yeah, like I did, did not want to leave that. And then when, when, when I did move up here, my friendships became a lot more virtual. Like if, I mean, it's, it's weird. Like I, I, I met you <laughs> like, and uh, we haven't actually met in, in real life. Um, we haven't met in person, I should say, uh, <laughs> we, uh, but, uh, but like, that became my my social interaction with people it's like i i you know one of the and my and my in-person friends up here are are people you know it's 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 weird like i i I, the first year that i lived here they lived up here the first six months i was very anxious because i was like i don't have any i don't have any friends that i hang out with i'm too far away from the city i don't you know like uh, there's only a few people that I saw regularly, and that that made me anxious. And when COVID hit, it was like, okay, I can relax. I don't need to actually feel like I need that because nobody can have that right now. So that was kind of a relief in a way. And now I'm just kind of used to it, but uh, I didn't didn't like that at first. So when when uh, when it might seem like okay, I'm I'm married. I'm a little bit older. I live in this bucolic place. I don't really need as much of that social interaction. It's not that far away. And I think that I wouldn't want to be more secluded than I am now. Like I've thought about it. I've thought of like, especially in this last year, like thinking like it, you know, if I am in my forties now, I got, I kind of need a retirement plan. What am I going to do? Well, I could, maybe I can throw together enough money to put a down payment on a house in somewhere very far away from, from here. not near any of my friends in-person friends or anyone that I know at all. Mm -hmm. And maybe we could be happy with our cats and our, (laughs) and our dog and my wife and just, that's it. A garden, you know, maybe I could be happy. That would be kind of awesome. But, um, but I also like, 
I mean, that's, uh, that's something very, very different than anything I've had my entire life until recently. Mm. So, and I don't know how, what it's like for other people, you know, the, this, this trope of you get married, you have kids, you move to the suburbs and you live a happy life with a truck and a boat and a whatever. Oh, man, <laughs> I don't know about happy. <laughs> or, well, I mean, it does actually seem pretty nice to have your tribe or whatever, you know, your, your community. Uh, like, as I get older, I realize that the community is so nice. Man, it must be so nice yeah. to have neighbors that you can trust. You know, mm-hmm. that must be so nice because I never had that. Mm-hmm. I lived in a city my entire life. Um, There's less anxiety when options are closed off. I mean, I think having choices makes you anxious. Um, it's sort of It's sort of nice when options are closed. It's like, well, we live here. We can't pull the kids out of school. You get to know your neighbors, right? It, yeah. it takes the burden of choice off of you, right? If you're living in New York and you're young and you're childless, there's so many options about where to go get involved. <laughs> That's um, true. You need some limitations. You need some rules and limitations. So it ends up being a relief to kind of surrender, I so. right? I mean, it's the same thing of you're born into a family and into a city and you're there and you don't get to <laughs> do what I've done, which is, you know, unsubscribe very meticulously from the world around you and subscribe elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, I don't, yeah. You know, in general, people don't really know their neighbors. Um, Well, that's the, to to me seems very wrong. I mean, that does this something. Well, are you, are you willing to give? Well, I mean, I, I, I mean, it's a generation thing, I think, but it's it's like, we have become very individualistic in this country, and I don't really like it. I, it's well, a- it's not individualistic necessarily. I mean, it's like, essentially, like, again, me going on Twitter, l- reading the feed is essentially like walking out my door and going down to the street. It's just that the the people are not where I am, but I know that they're there. And it feels like we are neighbors in a sense. And that, that my neighborhood yeah. is the whole world. And I'm tuned into like the to individual little bulbs, little light bulbs all over the earth. I think that works in an intellectual sense. But I don't think that yeah. works. I don't think it works when you I mean, what happened to the what happened to the idea of like a family like living together like what like uh, you know i guess i think about how old are the kids well the the thing i i mean like why does why do people not live with their parents or why do they not live with their grandparents what like when did that start to happen like we used to live all families together in one house forever (laughs) like that's my 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 wife is my 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 wife is filipino and their families stay together for a very long time yeah and they have for generations that's the way that they've been since they were people who lived on an island, right? Um, yeah. And uh, and in this country, we've moved away from that, and we've got this nuclear family, and like it's stressful because the minute that you can't take yeah. care of your son or daughter, yeah. like you have to trust a stranger to do it, or a school, or an institution, which sucks, um, and uh, and that's hard. So it's easy for someone like you or me to say that we we step outside our tent in a digital world, but that we, you can't do that. You can't do that unless that's, that's something that you can do as an individual. And that's what I mean by individualistic. Yeah. Mm. yeah like in a sense, my, my real life, which I mean, my, my surface level life, by which I mean, you know, being able to walk out my door in my neighborhood and go walk around safely. It's like, I, I make sure to preserve the safety and continuity of that life and have it be safe and regular and orderly. And, you know, like I understand the rules governing that, that place and, you know, cars driving in and out or whatever, um, to sort of preserve my access and free, free exploration of the online which is essentially made up of other people from within their own carefully curated, not, not, not the right word, uh, manicured, maybe, real lives that serve their own 
expression online. Because, right, like, without the internet, where, and, you know, I mean, this raises an interesting uh, question in my field, say, for, for poets, right? There is the street poet and there's the office poet. I've very much become the latter. You know, how would I do if I had to go put on, you know, uh, <laughs> clothes, A, but B, like, you know, a, a coat and go bring a, you know, go bring a typewriter out to like the public square and be (laughs) sort of, you know, be like a thespian, right? No, you know, go, go do the usual shtick of writing love poems or writing about the universe, right? Essentially being what I've told you I am, which is a professional stoned teenager, right? Could I go out in the square and do it? Essentially be like a joker, be like a court jester, right? Which really an all honesty is part of the job that I have told myself I, I do online, right? This is part of it. But I mean, I've become so cerebral and so professional and mature about it, right? I don't let loose like I used to. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of really, really good office poets out there who are, you know, I don't really try to get published. You know, I if I really wanted to, I could make a spreadsheet and go find the 25 places and editors to submit. I just don't do that. I, I publish my own stuff. I like my link tree. I went through it and I trimmed it today. It looks nice. Um, but you know, <laughs> money, money won't, won't come in from that. I'm sort of waiting mm. to be discovered. Um, and I'm not being discovered and that's, <laughs> you know, waiting to be discovered. Oh man, I think I think that's probably. Uh, I feel for you. That could be the title, and also maybe a good a good. I mean, like that's like the whole nexus of the whole creator economy and audiences. It's like everyone screaming wants to be discovered. Essentially, my my I don't know if it's my whole argument, but it's like no one cares. No one's gonna just. Dis- no one really cares to discover you. But this isn't really true. But it's like, there's so hmm. much to discover. There's so many voices already. Um, in I order, mean, to, yeah. In order to be discovered, you just need to keep on using your voice. I actually, honestly, believe that you just I need do. to not. You just need. You just need to not die and just out yes. and, and just not stop. You just need to. You just need to get old. Yeah. Like, if you like, that's the only way. The um, most beautiful thing about about social media and I think what its intended purpose was is to bring together like-minded people. And I think that, that, that uh, it allows us to, to use our voices. It allows us to be creative and, and produce and create and, and, and find those like-minded people that that's when you will get noticed. That's when you will be noticed. Now, the problem is, is that people have different, People do not understand like your your ambition. They don't understand what drives you, and and I find this. And that's my bad. fault. I mean, I I should write that out in a one pager. I have no yeah, excuse maybe. for not doing that, but I won't do it. I'll do everything but that. One of the problems I have with something like Twitter is that I I will use Twitter as a as a place to be be creative, and p- most people will assume that what I want is more followers or more attention and that's not really what i'm looking for it or they, they assume that like if i am looking for that i'm looking for that for a different reason not simply just to have a lot of followers i mean i know i know a lot of people that that's their goal uh, is just to get a lot of eyeballs on them yeah um, so so this is another big like critique of the creator economy is like well where are you taking people All right this is an article i've I've sent you probably nine times. It's called You're On Your Own by Bob Lefsetz. And he says, you know, if you're if you're compromising to appeal to some audience, stop. They don't care. The whole point of the game is to get a size of audience you that satiates you and take people on a trip. Right? This is what having vision is all about. Where are you taking people? Right? It's like you have my attention. Now what? Like now what? Like where, where can you, like, how can you transform me? Are you willing to transform me? Are you willing to tell me something brave? What are you willing to do now that you have me? Right. And I think a lot of people focus on getting the attention, but then it turns out that they have nothing to show once they have attention. 
right? We go back to that red light syndrome. So all of a sudden, ah, your cue comes. Here it is. You have a thousand listeners. You've gone viral. What do you really have to say? What's your big idea? And it's like, oh shit, I don't actually really have anything of substance to say. Which is fine. Then you can redirect the spotlight to underprivileged folks who deserve more spotlight. And it's fine. And it's like, well, then you're just a facilitator of spotlight. Which is fine. I don't know if that's being an artist. If you're an artist, you dance naked in public. I'm starting to question if I really have the guts to be at my edge and keep doing it. Right? I really should just be spewing words on Twitter all day, going on going on Clubhouse, like really living in the act of, you know, burning. I'm I, looking forward to having a very uh, naked summer. <laughs> <laughs> naked boy summer. I'm I'm looking forward to having a very naked naked art summer. Naked art summer. <laughs> okay. There's our title. <laughs> okay. Naked art summer hyphen waiting to be discovered. Waiting to be discovered. And there there's a lot well and that's I mean that's the challenge of the so called creator economy is what are you willing to do? Because really anyone can turn on the camera or type their thoughts. Everyone's doing it. So you really have to rate, you really have to up the ante. You really have to say how, like you have to scare yourself. And I mean, that's really the job. And that's the only way people are going to be interested is if you're scaring yourself, they'll tune, they'll tune in for that. They'll tune in for, for, for you at your edge, Mm -hmm. but you have to be, be like, it's a factory job of, all right, I'm going to go back to the factory of the edge of my comfort zone. And just put in a day's work at the edge of your comfort zone, pushing it. And that, and that, that takes courage. And that's, you know, it's hard to find the motivation to keep doing that. Um, and, you know, of course, once you get successful, they want more of what they've gotten from you before. They want you to be what you were yesterday and, and you know, th- three months ago. That's what they're paying for. Now it takes a lot of guts to then say, well, you know, if you want my old stuff, you got to buy the old album because I'm not about the standards anymore. I'm, I'm the person who's changing and that's the artist. There we go. And thank you for listening, everybody. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time.